Hey guys, this is Mrs. Future, and this video is about graphing simple rational functions. Alright, so we're going to start with rational functions. The definition of a rational function is some polynomial divided by some other polynomial um, in a ratio, and q of x, the bottom of the fraction, is not zero. Okay, we're going to start by graphing the rational parent function, which is just good old f of x equals 1 over x, the most basic parent function that we have for a rational. And the graph of that, um, if you think about it, we can't divide by 0. So x cannot be 0. And if x can't be 0, that means that we are going to have what we call an asymptote on the y-axis. An asymptote is this imaginary line that your graph is going to approach but never touch. There's also going to be an asymptote at y um, is 0, or y cannot be 0 either, because there's nothing I can divide 1 by that will ever give me 0. So I have these two imaginary lines on the graph that can't exist. Now let's make a table of values for x and y. If x is 1, y is 1. 1 over 1 is 1. If x is 2, y is 1 half. If x is 3, y is 1 third. And it's just going to go 1 um, one, one half, one third, one fourth, and so on. It's going to get closer and closer, but it's never going to touch that dotted line. Um, if we go back towards zero, if x was one half, y would be two, because one divided by a half is two, and then one third would be three, and so on and so on, and so it goes infinitely up like that. Now, if we were to graph the negatives, if I just stuck negatives in front of all my x's, one over negative one is negative one, one over negative two is negative one half. So um, all the negative x's produce negative y's. It's just a reflection across the origin. So what we end up with is what's called a hyperbola. It has two branches, um, and it has two asymptotes. So let's write that down. The horizontal asymptote is at y equals 0, and the vertical asymptote is at x equals 0. And then we can talk about the domain and range of this as well. Your book asks you for all the different ways to write it. Um, I just prefer the domain and range um, to be written in interval notation. My domain is negative infinity until it hits the asymptote at zero. And it's a soft bracket because it doesn't touch it. And then it picks right up again after zero and continues to infinity. Our range is the same thing. Negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity. All right, now the translations that we've been learning about all year long, they apply to these two. So if I took my basic 1 over x, I could stick an a out in front, and that's your vertical stretch or shrink. Um, I could put a b in the bottom with the x part. That would be your horizontal um, stretch or shrink. The minus h will shift it left or right, and the plus k will shift it up or down. So when you're graphing a rational function and it's in this format, you can use this um, to figure out where your asymptotes are going to go. Be so your vertical asymptote, which is always at x equals 0, now will shift left or right h. And so our vertical asymptote will now be at x equals h. Um, our horizontal asymptote, which is normally at y equals 0, will shift up or down k. So it will now be y equals k. So these values tell you where your asymptotes go. All right, here's an example. y equals negative 6 over x plus 3 and then plus 2. So what we know is the negative is going to reflect it over the x-axis. The 6 is going to stretch it vertically. The 3 will shift it to the left 3 units. And the plus 2 will shift it all up to. So what I've done is put my horizontal axis um, asymptote at y equals 2 and I've put my vertical asymptote at x equals negative 3. Um, a little trick, and we'll talk about this later, but you can um, get your, at your vertical asymptote. All you have to do is divide or set the bottom equal to 0. If I set x plus 3 equal to 0, then x would have to be negative 3. Now to get the rest of the points, I usually just make a table because now I know where the middle of my hyperbola is, so I'll pick the next x over, say, um, negative 2, and plug it in. Put it in the bottom there, negative 2 plus 3 is 1. Negative 6 divided by 1 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus 2 is negative 4. And then I plot that on the graph. 
All right, that was Billy wanted a shout out. All right, when x is negative 1, negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3, plus 2 is negative 1. So right there, when x is 0, negative 6 divided by 3 is negative 2, plus 2 is 0. Um, and then you can see that this is going to approach the asymptote here. You can sketch this in here. All you people talking are annoying me. Okay, it's going to be hard to hear me because my fifth period is in here now, but I've got to finish this video. So if I were to plug in a negative 3 for x, negative 3 plus 3 is 0, so we can't have that. If we were to plug in a negative 4 for x, negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1, negative 6 divided by negative 1 is 6, plus 2 is 8. So at negative 4, we're at 8. And it's really, it's just going to match. It's going to reflect across the center point here. So you could just count it. Um, but we could also plug in negative 5. Negative 5 is going to give you um, negative 1. No, that's not. It's going to give you 5. Yeah, I can do math. So negative 5 will give you 5. Negative 6 um, will give you 4, and so on. So once you get these basic points in the main curve, that's all that's really required. So what is required, by the way, is the asymptote with horizontal and vertical in the left or the left and right or top and bottom branches of your hyperbola. Now the domain of this one is going to be negative infinity, but our x's are going to be interrupted by the vertical asymptote at negative 3, and then it picks right back up and goes infinitely. The range, the y values, begin at negative infinity. It's interrupted at our horizontal asymptote at 2, and then picks back up and goes to infinity. Some other simple rational functions that we're going to deal with look like this. y equals ax plus b, some linear, divided by y equals cx plus d, another linear. Um, one thing you can do, and that they'd like to do in the textbook, is just do this long division and turn it into standard forms. Let's, uh, well, I can't do an example, I have letters, but you can do long division, turn it into the regular form that we just worked with. Another thing you can do is to just know the couple of rules those rules say that our vertical asymptote is always going to exist where the denominator is zero because you can't divide by zero. So x would be negative d over c or whatever that number happens to be. Our horizontal asymptote is always going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients. And this really only works when you have the same power, but right now, since we're doing simple, um, these are all linear. Just remember that if you took the ratio of this A over this C, that would be your horizontal asymptote. So now here's example two. We've got y equals 4x minus 2 over x minus 1. If we were to do the long division, this is what we would get. Okay, so x goes into 4x four times. 4 times x is 4x. 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. Subtract the entire group. Negative 2 minus negative 4 is positive 2. So that's our remainder. So what we have is um, it equals 4 plus our remainder over x minus 1. So if you look at this in rational form, we've got a vertical stretch of 2. We've got a horizontal shift right 1. And we've got a vertical shift up 4. So what that tells us is our horizontal asymptote is at y equals 4. You could also have just looked at the leading coefficients, that 4 and that 1, said the ratio of 4 to 1 is 4. I think that's easier, but sometimes um, you're going to be asked to do the long division. So our horizontal asymptote is at y equals 4. Our vertical asymptote, when we set the bottom equal to 0, that bottom or this bottom is the same same denominator. We're going to get x equals 1. So it goes here. And then you make a table for the rest of the values to graph it. And so if I plugged in a 2 for x, 2 divided by 2 minus 1, 4 plus 2 is 6. If I plugged in a 3 for x, 
I would have um, 3 minus 1 is 2, 2 over 2 is 1, 4 and 1 is 5. And so those are your inner points there. That's enough. That gives us our inner curve. If I plugged in a 0 for x, we would have um, 0 minus 1 is negative 1, so 4 minus 2 is 2. And if I plugged in a negative 1 for x, I would get 3, and so I see those. Oops, I'm sorry, I put that in the wrong place. There and there, go like that, and like that. Here's another tricky example. Um, this time I just asked you to find the asymptotes, so we don't have to actually graph it. However, um, if you just use my method and you say your horizontal asymptote is 8 over 4, y equals 2, you have to also remember that you're shifting it up 1. And then your vertical asymptote is where you cannot equal 0 in the bottom. So if I set the bottom equal to 0, x equals 3 fourths. So be careful of a tricky one like this because you're shifting it up 1, but that 1 is not where your asymptote is. You've got to look at this as well and then just put them together. Now I also want to show you how to do this one using the division, the long division, because I can take 4x minus 3 and divide it into the 8x plus 2. And then whenever I'm done, I'm going to add 1 to the end. So 4x goes into 8x two times. 2 times 4x is 8x. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. And then we have to subtract. 2 minus negative 6 is 8. So that's the remainder. So we have y equals, um, it equals 2, right, plus our remainder over our divisor. And then we've got to remember that we've got this plus 1 here, plus 1. So our equation is actually going to be y equals, and then it's 8 over 4x minus 3. And then say we've got this plus 2, and we also have a plus 1, so we actually have a plus 3. So now we can say, all right, that means, oh, and we also have to factor out a 4 here. Um, so we've got 8 over, you'd have to take out the b value. And so we've got x minus 3 fourths, and then plus 3. So now you can easily see your h and your k, which we already said that the way we did it before, but... Our uh, vertical asymptote is going to be at x equals 3 fourths, and our horizontal asymptote, y equals 3. All right, now I need to show you how to do the word problem. This is what we call an average value problem. All right, Mrs. Beecher buys a carrot coffee maker for $180. Cake cups cost about 88 cents each. Write an equation for the average cost of a cup of coffee as a function of the number x cup of coffee. If you were to be back in Algebra 1 writing a linear equation, you would say, okay, my um, cost of a cup of coffee is my constant, 180 plus 88 cents per cup, right? Only we want the average cost of a cup of coffee. So this means that this 180 also has to be divided by x. The whole thing has to be divided by x, actually. The average cost of a cup of coffee is to take that original $180 I spent, divide it by however many cups of coffee we've um, drink plus the 88 cents per cup, okay? So when you see the average cost, either way you want to set this up equals the same thing. So what is the horizontal asymptote and what does it represent? My horizontal asymptote, if I had it in this format, my leading coefficient would be 0.88 over 1. Or in this uh, version, it's shifted up 0.88. Either way, it's at y equals 0.88. What does it represent? That represents the cost that our average cost is approaching. It's never going to be any less than that because that's what they're charging per cup. So that's the average cost, um, what the average cost is approaching. Okay, now Starbucks charges $1.99 for a grande cup of coffee, and that's just a normal coffee, plain, boring coffee. After how many cups will Mrs. Beecher start saving money? So I could set this up. Um, take the equation, 180 over x 
plus 0.88 and go, okay, well, when does that equal $1.99? So now we just um, do some algebra. $1.99 minus 88, so we'd say 180 over x equals 1.11. Then we have to multiply both sides by x and divide both sides by 1.11. And 180 divided by 1.11 is 162.162. Now, that means I have to have 106. I have to have more than that amount. So during the 163rd cup, so after 162, or during the 163rd, is when I'd start saving money. There's the bill. All right, last one. Mrs. Butcher and her husband have two cups of coffee a day. How many days will they start saving money? So if we each have two cups of coffee per day, that's four cups per day. So I'm going to now have to, um, well, all I really have to do is say, well, if it's 162 days for one cup of coffee per day, divide it by four. And that's 42, or I'm sorry, 40 and a half. So after 40 days, or on the 41st day, after 40, which would be on the 41st day. So, therefore, if we own our cured coffee maker for more than 40 days, then it's a bargain, right? It's worth it. And to end this, fifth period wants to say hello. Ready? Say it. Uh,